Hey YouTubers, it's me, Lonnie Clark, Nuts for Art, and I'm here to read you another episode, this lovely episode of Dr. John Goffman's Oral History of You Got It, Human Radiation Studies, Remembering the Early Years. Oh, how sentimental. Dr. John W. Goffman Oral History, conducted December 20th, 1994 by the United States Department of Energy. They had to take an oral history because they had no documents. They were all strewn all over the place. And there was no records of anybody giving any orders to human tests. So that director of the Department of Energy thought that they would, like, do an oral history. So I'm going to continue reading. We are on a new subchapter. I think I'll take my glasses off. That's probably the best. Instead of putting on another pair of glasses. <laughs> So, okay, here we go. Conflict with the AEC of low-level effects of radiation, 1969, and that makes me spit nails. Wasn't it recently that we had uh, Dr. Busby telling me that brand new studies showing that low-level radiation is harmful? We've known low-level radiation is the harm. Anyways, let's get into it. Goffman. At any rate, I was coming up to 69 and the talk that I gave. Tamplin had an invitation to this nuclear power thing. I'd given the talk at the IEEE, -E -E, as I say, an extremely conciliatory talk. Not a wild raving maniac thing at all, which I'm capable of doing. Anyway, Mike May gave me over and says, Jack, the AEC is upset with your talk before the IEEE. -E -E. And I said, why? It was such a reasonable talk. He said, no, no, it's not what you said. It's the fact that you didn't notify them in advance of giving it. And they get flack from newspaper people and so forth. And he said, would it be agreeable with you whenever you or Tamplin or somebody is going to give one of the papers on the health effects of radiation, which was our mission, just doing my job, would you consider sending a copy to the AEC in advance? And I said, sure, that's fine. They're not going to censor it, I said. He said, no, who would stand for that? Hmm. Yeah, we know about this. They did this to Tamplin. Wow, jerks. Okay. The next paper up was Tamplin's for the Nuclear Power Symposium. We gave a copy to Mike May and a copy off to Washington. A couple of days later, Tamplin walked into my office, threw down this paper on my desk. He says, look at this. I looked at it. Everything was, everything was lined out that he wanted to say. The only thing left were the prepositions and conjunctions. <laughs> I said, did this come back from Washington? He said, hell no, this is Roger Batzel, who is May, Mike May's right hand. He told me that if I want to go, go ahead and give the original talk at the meeting. But I can only go as a private citizen, not as the member of the Livermore Lab. I cannot use laboratory secretaries to type anything, and I must pay for my own expenses for the travel. Ordinarily, the lab loved it when we would go talk somewhere. It's publicity for the lab. Gorley, especially if there were no harmful proven effects. Goffman, right. So all these things we can't announce, even being a member of Livermore, I just couldn't believe it. I just couldn't believe it. I called up Mike, and I believe the se that and I believe that session he came over to see me. I said, Mike, what in the world is going on? I agreed to have this stuff we are doing seen by the AEC in advance. But, I said, censorship. But censorship like this? Mike said, Jack, why don't you be realistic? This is the first time Mike had ever said anything to me like that. You know what I told him? You know, when I told Totter to go to hell about the stern glass thing, he didn't say a word about it. He said, he, he said, why don't you be realistic? You can't just put this stuff out. I said, I am very realistic, Mike. If I'm going to stand, 
I'll tell you what I'm going to do this afternoon. I'm going to call up the guy who's organizing the AAAS Nuclear Power Symposium, and I'm going to tell him that Tamplin can't come to that meeting. The reason he can't come is the Livermore Lab is a scientific whorehouse. It's being censored by the Livermore Lab. Mike said, Jack, you know, we've known each other a long time. He says, why don't you go home and sleep on it and we'll talk tomorrow. And I said, well, I'm telling you what I'm going to do, Mike. He said, yeah, I know, but just sleep on it. The next day we got together and I had already called the guy from the AAAS Nuclear Power Symposium and told him exactly what I told Mike that I was going to tell him. He was very upset because he was going to be the chairman of this meeting. He didn't want to have to read my letter to the assembled meeting saying that the Livermore Lab was a scientific whorehouse. So Mike said, you really did that? Yeah, but it's just, but it's just what I said I would do, Mike. He stormed out and we never talked for about nine months after that. Well, then the rest is sort of history. New subtitle. Hmm, he's throwing down the gauntlet at the censorship, folks. They taught him, didn't they? And so, by the way, as a little aside, I read this in my book, Tamplin actually did give that symposium. He left out everything they wanted. Testifying before Congress on radiation effects. Goffman. Senator Edmund Muskie, Democrat of Minnesota, was holding some hearings on the underground uses of nuclear energy. His aide in Washington had asked if I'd come and testify. He, he didn't know about this whole paper I'd given. So I essentially upgraded the thing Tamplin and I had done and went back to testif testify before Muskie's committee. Senator Mike Gravel was there from Alaska, and he turned out to be a real friend. Yeah, he got killed in a uh, plane crash. They kind of took care of him. Muskie was very friendly, but then it was pretty sure that we'd, we'd, we'd better call that number 13,000 deaths, not 16,000 deaths. We'd been wavering before that. Ed Bowser was the secretary on the Joint Committee on Atomic Energy. This is also very important for you to know. The Joint Committee on Atomic Energy was an as as excuse me for that folks. The Joint Committee on Atomic Energy was as aristocratic as you can get. Ed Bowser came into Muskie's hearing room and he said, "Can you come over to the Joint Committee headquarters? The chairman wants to see you." That's Chet Holdfield, H-O-L-I-F-I-E-L-D, Chet Holifield, U.S. Representative from California. The chairmanship of the Joint Committee on Atomic Energy alternated. One, ses one session it would be a senator, the next it would be a House Representative. They went back and forth. Holifield was the chairman. So I said, sure, I can come over and said, Tamplin is in town with me. Oh, bring him along by all means. Here comes the intimidation. So we went over to the headquarters and went through secret passages of the congressional building. They were up there in the green room, all very secret. There were a number of people from the joint committee staff there. I remember one guy by the name of Dr. Graham. He was friendly. Chet Holyfield, and Craig Hosmer of the Joint Committee came in, and Holyfield turned to me and said, Just what the hell do you two think you're doing? Getting all those little old ladies in tennis shoes up in arms about our atomic energy program. I said, I don't think we're doing that, Mr. Holyfield. We're doing our job. This guy Graham said, Mr. Holyfield, these are two of our most distinguished scientists from the Livermore Lab. Holyfield said, I don't give a damn who they are. They're hurting the atomic energy program. He said, listen, I've been told that if we gave everybody in this country a hundred times the dose that's allowed, nobody would be hurt. And I said, well, Mr. Holyfield, that doesn't agree with anything we've learned about this question. That sounds like a horrible dose. Where did you get that? He said. The Atomic Energy Commissioners told me that, the fuckers, as usual, the NRC fucking loves killing people. <coughs> Excuse me. Well, I said, Mr. Holyfield, look into it. 
I'm surprised, and that doesn't square with our findings. He said, that's what they told me. Then he turned to me and said, there are people like you who have tried to hurt the Atomic Energy Commission program before. We got them, and we'll get you. He didn't mean to kill us, but he meant he would take care of our reputation. That's a long story. Hefner. This is a congressperson? Goffman. Yes, the chairman of the Joint Committee and the representative of the House of Representatives from California, no less. Hefner. Threatening you? Goffman. Yes. We went back on the airplane, and I said to Tamplin, where the hell do you think the commissioners got this stuff? Is Chet Holyfield telling it straight that he was told that a hundred times the dose wouldn't hurt anybody? He said, I don't know. So we went through everything we could, and we found one thing that could be the basis of it. Namely, that Robley Evans at MIT was continuing to study the dial painters. He had published stuff saying that he saw no harm down under a thresh under a thousand rads, not a rad under a thousand rads. You get this? He published stuff saying that he saw no harm down under a thousand rads, not a rad under a thousand rads. The commissioners were obviously referring to Robley Evans and the dial painters from the 1920s. There were plenty of things wrong with this thousand rad safe threshold. My later studies show that there were many allusions to 500 or more reds being safe in addition to Robley Evans. But that, but there was this basis and others, and they did misinform Holyfield. By then, the newspaper people were getting interested in the whole thing. CBS television decided to have a week-long set of five morning sessions on radiation hazards, and we were on five of them, and the commissioners were on some of them. What we had, what we had said in our paper was, we ought to think of cutting the allowable dose tenfold, and the AEC said this was awful. The AEC said, We've never go, we've, we're never going to give people even one millirad, let alone 170, mil, 170 millirads. And I said, then you've got a problem. We're suggest cutting it to 17. Then they would turn around and say, we don't know if that's enough of a cushion. That didn't make any sense at all. Everybody who was anybody at the Atomic Energy Commissioners we're getting their feet in deeper and deeper in this whole controversy. Glenn Seaborg had written a book recently in which he says exactly that. I'll tell you about that in a little bit. That's when things really started happening. We were on these TV programs, CBS Morning Show, lots of newspaper articles, and the Saturday Evening Post. And somebody asked John Totter what he thought of our work, and he said, it's ludicrous, just nothing correct about it at all. Gorley, I've read criticisms. John Goffman's sloppy work, bad statistics. What do you have to say about these things? Goffman, what do I have to say? What I have to say is that whatever rubbish you were reading is undocumented bull, blah, blah, blah. They put the dots, he actually said bullshit. That's cute. They put the dots, how sweet. It just became a war. It just became a war as far as they were concerned. They were going to destroy us. A couple of interesting things happened. I wrote a letter to Glenn Seaborg. Let me see, we've got 13 minutes. I said, Glenn, you've got some rotten apples in that barrel. Your staff attacks us on, on us are going to hurt you. I'm going, it's going to hurt the atomic energy program. It's going to hurt us. It's going to discredit everything. I said, I think you ought to do something about it. We're doing exactly the job we were assigned to do. He wrote back and said, the way we're doing things is we don't reach down into the departments. You're going to have to solve this with John Totter. There was no solving it with John Totter. He was continuing to attack us, as were others in the commission. Glenn did not publicly attack. This came later. I heard back from the Joint Committee on Atomic Energy. Bowser called me up and said, 
The chairman is inviting you to a hearing. We're going to discuss your work. That was the plan. The standard plan for destroying you was to hold a hearing where people from all over the commission come in and address the issues you were raising. I just realized we better have a lot more ammunition. Art Tamplin and I worked our butts off and we did about 14 separate papers. They referred to us as the GT, Goffman Tamplin documents, and they were all eventually published in the congressional record. So we had 178 pages of testimony. I said to Browser, tell the chairman I need about three hours to testify. He said, three hours? We've never given anyone over in an hour, over an hour. I said, well, I think we need three hours. I have a lot to say. He said, well, I'll talk to the chairman. He comes back, calls me up and says, you have one hour. The chairman says if there's more than you have more than that you have to talk about, we'll schedule some more hearings. So we did so we had 178 pages of scientific stuff, and I took it over to the information division at Livermore Lab. They nearly had a conniption fit. They had heard all the flack about this. Roger Batzel came running over to see me. We've always maintained an open dialogue in spite of everything. He said, What's going on here? Why do you need these 178 pages of stuff? And you want to 250 copies? I said, yes, Roger. Chet Holyfield has invited me to speak at the hearing of the Joint Committee. And I said, if you don't want to do it, I'll call Holyfield's office and tell him the lab has decided not to permit me to prepare this material for you, Mr. Holyfield. He said, oh, no, 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 don't do that. We'll do it. So I got the 250 copies, of which I sent 100 to scientists around the country, thinking it might be a good idea to have a copy of it out in some other people's hands. Wow, that says a lot. When we went in and presented the thing, I thought we were going to... I'm sorry, I'm going to read this again. When we went in and presented the thing, I thought they were going to just tear it apart. Holyfield said, well... You've submitted so much material. We haven't had time to go over it. We'll call you back. Do nothing until you hear from me. So we never heard from him again. I'm going to stop there. This is a new uh, subchapter. We're getting to the real meat of it. The subtitle, the new subtitle is called Goffman and Tamplin Ostracized. Sound familiar, anti-nukers? Hmm. Nuke truthers, people who tell the truth about nuclear pollution. Put your courage feet on. Believe in peace. Love is greater than fear. Remember that. And uh, happiness is resistance. And so I'm happy to resist. <laughs> Ciao, you guys.